Pictures are for entertainment. Messages should be delivered by Western Union, said bold producer Samuel Goldwyn, owner of the best list of personal quotes on IMDb. And he's right. There is nothing harder for a film to do than convincing the audience of anything. Actually, I wouldn't be exaggerating if I said it is simply impossible. No sexist racist on this earth will ever walk out of, say, hidden figures thinking Wow, how wrong I was before, now I'm all in favor of racial and sexual equality. You need to already agree with whatever statement a movie is defending to buy its message. And even if you agree, when a character gets preachy about it, it is physical impossible not to cringe. You've got to do better, Senator. Ugh. Can you believe it? A female hero. Nice for my daughter to have someone like that to look up to. <laughs> In this day and age of woke Hollywood, it became an epidemic. You can't sit down and watch a bunch of CGI models punching each other without some clumsy agenda landing on your face. Don't worry. She's got help. <laughs> Heavy-handedness, though, does not sentence a movie to suckiness. Aaron Sorkin writes great screenplays. They all, to a greater or lesser degree, carry the simple message of Left, right, right, wrong. But they are great screenplays nonetheless. One of the most important filmmakers of all time, Sergei Eisenstein worked on nothing but communist propaganda. Still great pictures. Actually, when you get to political cinema, boy, should you be ready for unsubtlety. I think we're all tired of the politics. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's why we made Total Devastation. It's for everyone. You know, it's a popcorn movie. Just take a look at this scene from Bernardo Bertolucci's 1900, which is both the title and the length. Listen to me, comrade. Fascists don't spring up someday like mushrooms or one night. I bet you can't even tell if I added the Soviet anthem or if it was there already. You are accused of treason and anti-Soviet behavior. The court finds you guilty and sentenced you to be shot. Is it even possible to deliver a message without forcing your audience's eyes to roll? Like I said, only those who agree with you already will appreciate it. But yes. Before we get to the film, you know I'll analyze because it's in the thumbnail, but I somehow insist on keeping in useless suspense. Let's talk about what is likely the most commonly delivered message in movie history. War is bad. Making an anti-war film is actually quite easy. Just make a war film. People suffer, people die, war is hell. Where Oscar? Everybody this side of Helmut von Moltke will agree that no depiction of war paints a positive image. Even heroism comes with too high a price. There are still many films that declare themselves as anti-war. They usually show how meaningless death can be and how innocent people have their lives destroyed for no reason. The energy of the message might vary, from subtle... En espérant que c'est la dernière. <rire> tu te fais des illusions. Toi, bip too much. I wonder if the film is trying to tell me something. But I believe the best way to make an anti-war movie and the best way to make any message movie is when the story completely revolves around the theme without characters needing to state anything aloud. With that in mind, we move on to one of the greatest films ever made and the best screenplay to ever deliver a message in movie history. David Lynn's The Bridge on the River Kwai. Based on the novel by Pierre Boulle, the screenplay was written by two incredible screenwriters, Carl Foreman and Michael Wilson. They were both blacklisted at the time and could not technically work in Hollywood. So you can imagine how these guys had to be masters of understatement. The secret of the bridge on the river Kwai is in one word. 
irony. It has just one single on the nose war is hell moment, when a young terrified Japanese soldier is killed and we see his family photo. That part aside, the film critiques war by showing it as the world turned upside down, as every man going against his own nature, as the very incarnation of madness. Now let's follow along the story of the bridge on the river Kwai to see how every single plot point, how every single character action is the opposite of what should be expected. There's gonna be a busy pair of grave diggers, Weaver. Burma, 1943, World War II. British Colonel Nicholson and his soldiers arrive at a Japanese POW camp. They arrive whistling the obscure Colonel Bogey March, which, because David Lean knows how to make a damn good movie, became one of the most famous tunes in the world. The camp commander, Colonel Saito, tells the prisoners they will all be forced to build some type of structure over an unspecified body of water whose name I don't remember. So many mysteries. Nicholson is the most anal colonel who ever analed Phrasing. you've ever seen and tells Saito that under the rules of the Geneva Convention officers cannot be used for manual labor. Saito wipes his ass with the Geneva Convention, figuratively. Nicholson does not want his men to escape because they were ordered to surrender. In Singapore, we were ordered to surrender by command headquarters. Ordered, mind you. Therefore, in our case, escape might well be an infraction of military law. The first proof that Nicholson is an idiot. No, seriously. This guy's an idiot, a moron, an imbecile. He thinks the conducts of peacetime can transfer to wartime. He thinks he can act like a gentleman, suck up to the rules, respect and be respected. Without law, Commander, there is no civilization. That's just my point. Here, there is no civilization. Then we have the opportunity to introduce it. This manner of thinking shows he is completely inept for warfare. He faces the same problem of the protagonist of the masterpiece The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, who doesn't die and is not called Blimp. The character believes the Brits won World War I because they were gentlemen and played fair. Clean fighting, honest soldiering have won. When World War II arrives, he is told how dumb this line of thinking is. Because you've been educated to be a gentleman and a sportsman in peace and in war. But Clive, this is not a gentleman's war. War is no sport for gentlemen. You need to bend the rules, fight dirty. Like Stonewall Jackson said, mystify, mislead, surprise. Nicholson can't see it. He was ordered to surrender, so he thinks he is now mandated to be a prisoner. He forgets the more important order. The order he shouldn't even need to be told. Win the fucking war. Don't worry, his dumbness gets much, much worse. Because of his beloved Geneva Convention, Nicholson commands his officers not to work, so Saito tries to negotiate. He won't budge. Do you know what will happen to me if the bridge is not ready in time? I haven't the foggiest. I'll have to kill myself. What would you do if you are me? Uh, I suppose if I were you, I'd have to kill myself. Saito puts him in the oven. He won't budge. Saito threatens to force the sick man in the hospital to work. Still no. Finally, Saito decides to indulge Nicholson and have the officers not work. To save face though, he uses a crappy excuse of celebrating a holiday with a gift to his prisoners. As part of this amnesty, it will not be necessary for officers to do manual labor. Not fooling anyone. And so we have our first character forced by war to act against his own nature. Saito, a proud and compromising commander, had to bend over and treat his prisoner as an equal, because he knows war can't depend on logic. As he states in this brilliantly written rant. As he pointed out, it's against the rules. Do so not speak to me of rules! This is war! This is not a game of cricket! Because Nicholson's men are, you know, Soldiers, they have been half-assing the bridge construction job. I know it's obvious, but when your enemy wants a thing, you shouldn't help him have that thing. Nicholson wants to keep his men's morale, so he decides building the bridge will be the best way for it. I know our men. You've got to keep them occupied. The fact is, if there weren't any work for them to do, we'd invent some, eh, Reeves? In fact, we would, sir. You'd invent some? So, might I recommend inventing an escape plan? You moron!
Nicholson insists on building the best bridge that ever bridged and gets more into it than Saito himself. Nicholson has to justify himself to medical officer Clipton in this frustrating to hear but brilliantly written rant. Must we build them a better bridge than they could have built for themselves? If you had to operate on Saito, would you do your best or would you let him die? Would you prefer to see this battalion disintegrate in idleness? Would you have it said that our chaps can't do a proper job? Don't you realize how important it is to show these people that they can't break us in body or in spirit? It becomes clear Nicholson wants a proper bridge to satisfy himself. When the bridge is ready, the filmmakers even have his baton, the symbol of military command, fall from his hands. Will someone tell me why the old man wants us to build a proper bridge? Don't you worry about old Nick. He knows what he's doing. He didn't. And all this bridge stuff is only half the picture. Nicholson is not the protagonist. Our protagonist is American Navy Commander Shears, the most cynical of cynics. Here lies, you know, Weaver, I've forgotten who we just buried. Thompson. Here lies Corporal Herbert Thompson, serial number 01234567. Valiant member of the King's Own, or the Queen's Own, or something, who died of Berry Berry in the year of our Lord 1943. For the greater glory of. What did he die for? I love this guy. He doesn't want to be a hero, he doesn't want to be a gentleman, he just wants to escape and survive. Which he does, by complete luck. He thinks he can now leave the war and enjoy a sweet life. But he is the only living person who ever escaped that camp. So Major Warden, chief of a commando unit, hires him to lead a mission back to the camp to destroy the bridge. And here's the thing, Shears is not an officer. He just impersonated one to get better treatment. Not that it did me any good, because at Saito's camp the officers worked along with the rest. Yes, there's always the unexpected, isn't there? He doesn't want to fight, he just wants to go home. Anyway, it's the army, he has no choice. He's just volunteered to go back and help me blow up the quiet bridge. Really? Good show. Jolly good show, Major. And so begins what John Milius calls the best commando mission in movie history. He says it's so good because everything goes wrong. One of the soldiers dies immediately, and they are told they can't go through the same path Shears used. You speak Yai's language, I don't. He's gonna lead you back to the River Kwai himself, by a route I never took. Will someone tell me why I'm so indispensable to this outfit? Now, Major Warden is obsessed with the mission. He gets shot in the foot and keeps going before asking to be abandoned. He is willing to die for this mission. Guess who's the only major character who won't die in the end? Warden is the polar opposite of Shears, who doesn't abandon him but scolds men like him and Nicholson in this brilliantly written rant. You make me sick with your heroics. There's a stench of death about you. You carry it in your pack like the plague. Explosives and L-pills, they go well together, don't they? And with you, it's just one thing or the other. Destroy a bridge or destroy yourself. This is just a game, this war. You and that Colonel Nicholson, you're two of a kind. Crazy with courage. For what? How to die like a gentleman. How to die by the rules. When the only important thing is how to live like a human being. What the fuck happened to screenwriters? Why can't we have articulate characters with unique voices exposing their points of view anymore? This film should be a bombastic war adventure, yet it has better dialogue than any character-driven drama today. You need to do better, Hollywood! Shears and his men place the explosives and wait for the arrival of the train the following day, but... There's always the unexpected, isn't there? And the tide goes down, revealing the wires. After an excruciatingly tense sequence of Japanese soldiers almost seeing the wires, they are finally noticed. Who by? Colonel Nicholson, of course, who brings Saito to examine. Joyce, one of the commandos, kills Saito and tells Nicholson they must destroy Nicholson's baby. Blow up the bridge! Yes, look out the no! At this moment, Nicholson literally becomes the enemy. Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Shears, the unheroic cynic, then jumps in the water and rushes to save Joyce and kill Nicholson, but gets shot on his way. The only heroic action in Shears' life, something he never would have imagined himself doing, was completely useless. Only then does Nicholson realize what he has done. What have I done? Warden throws mortars to kill Joyce and Shears, so they won't be captured alive. Nicholson is wounded, stumbles around, and...
never know if Nicholson tumbled on the plunger intentionally, but it took him dying to finally act like a soldier. The only way this film could have been more ironic is if the train they destroyed had been full of allied prisoners, which would have made their victory completely pyrrhic. An imposing helicopter shot shows the end of the spectacle. You expect the words the end to appear, but Lin cuts to a shot of vultures. Vultures open and close the picture, because they are the true winners. They'll have a feast. To conclude, let's check what war made of our major characters. Saito, the tyrannic brute, capitulates and allows his inferior to boss him around. Nicholson, the gentlemanly sucker for rules, collaborates with the enemy to stroke his own ego. Warden, the selfless hero wannabe, plays no other part in his own mission besides killing his own men. And Shears, the selfish hustler who just wants to be left alone, goes on a mission that doesn't need him and dies a heroic death that achieves nothing. Well, there's always the unexpected, isn't there? This is The Bridge on the River Kwai, the most ironic story ever written, the best anti-war film ever made, and the most effective movie to ever deliver a message. Good show. Jolly good fun. Jolly, jolly good. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and share it. And what do you think is the most effective film to ever deliver a message? Leave a comment. I will see you next time and this is MovieWise.